Welcome back to Battleship Systems. Fire control involves a lot of foresight, some mathematical insight, and some downright luck when you're trying to smash a ton of steel on an enemy far away. In this episode, we finished the initial ballistic correction worksheet and finished laying or aiming the guns. Please check the errata page in the description. In our last episode, we found out how gravity, the atmosphere, the movement of our ship, the movement of the target, and the wind can change where our projector will land. If the target is close enough, we can look at it through their scopes in our director. In other words, we are looking through the line of sight. For surface targets, we always aim near the water line of the enemy vessel, so water can flood in and help sink the ship. All ballistic corrections are adjustments to this line of sight. But what if we can't see the target, such as the case with our 10,000 yard example? Then our only choice is to elevate the guns with respect to something called the horizontal plane. This is an imaginary plane tangent to the Earth's surface intersecting our ship at the water line. If some other mechanism can tell us the range and bearing, this will still work. But referencing the line of fire off the horizontal creates two problems. Number one is that the Earth's surface is not flat. If you imagine looking at a ship far away through the water, the further away the target is, the lower you'll have to look. Number two is that the gun trunnions are raised above the horizontal by the ship's hull, pushing this imaginary line of sight even further above the actual target. Now since the Earth is round, we can find the distance of this drop based on the range of the target. We can also find the mean trunnion height of our guns above the waterline. Depending on where we are, there might be another force that'll throw off our trajectory. Since the Earth is constantly spinning, if we launch a projectile from, let's say, the northern hemisphere at a target on the equator, even if the target is motionless, the water the target is sitting in is moving with the Earth's rotation. By the time the projectile completes its trajectory, it'll seem as if the ship has moved out of the way. This is the Coriolis effect, and it gets greater as we move away from the equator. Our range table gives us the movement caused by the Coriolis effect based off latitude and true bearing. Smaller projectiles don't need this correction because they don't have as much mass as a 16 inch projectile. The wind tends to keep them in line with Earth's rotation. This brings up an important point. Modern navies use missiles as their primary weapon. Let's take for instance the Tomahawk cruise missile. Sure, it's heavier than a 16 inch Mark 8 shell, weighing in at about 3,000 pounds, but it's huge. You could push the missile well off course at any point along its 18-foot body, compounded by the fact that it doesn't travel very fast, only about 840 feet per second. And that's how modern navies defend against missile attacks. They launch their own anti-ballistic missile to intercept the incoming one before it reaches the target. You also had the phalanx Sea Whiz to defend against incoming missiles at close range. An incoming 16-inch projectile has more momentum because it's more dense and it's traveling much faster. There's no way anybody could ever throw an incoming 16-inch shell off its trajectory. The only defense against it is armor. If another country were to make a man of war today with major caliber guns, we would have no defense against it. None of our Navy ships are armored. While we're on the topic of Earth's rotation, notice the table wants true target bearing, as opposed to relative bearing. True target bearing is measured from the true north, that is, the rotational axis of Earth. The only way we could find true north is with a gyro compass. Okay, I think we have everything we need to determine exactly where our projectile will land. Let's turn our relative motion vectors into yards of error. Starting with left and right errors. Now our target is moving 17.7 knots to the right. Our range table states that the deviation for lateral motion of target perpendicular to the line of fire at a speed of 10 knots at 10,000 yards away is 75 yards of error. But since the target moves at 17.7 knots, we need to divide that by 10 to get 1.7. Then we multiply that by column 18, and we get 127.5 yards, which we round to 128. 
Now, since this is a left vector, our projectile will land to the left of the target. So our error will be 128 yards to the left. Now let's do the wind. 7.1 knots, range table says per 10 is seven yards. So that's gonna be 0.7 times 10, we'll just say five. And since that's to the right, it'll be five yards to the right. Now for gun, 12.9, range table says per 10 is 68. So divided by that, it gets us 88. And since this is to the right, that's gonna be another right error of 88 yards. Now let's account for the rotation of the Earth. But for that, we'll need coordinate information. So let's say that we're 10 degrees north latitude and our true target bearing is 120 degrees. If we look at our Earth rotation deflection table for 10 degrees, we see that there's no entry for 10,000 yards. But for 8,000, it's one, and for 12,000, it's three. So the middle number will be two yards. And since this is a positive number, it'll be to the right. Now don't forget about drift. When fired, our projectile will move itself to the right by 20 yards. And this gives us a grand total of 13 yards to the left. Now let's work on our range errors. These can either be over or short. Target is moving away at 3.1 knots. Range table says per 10 is 75, so 3.3 times 75 is 23. Since it's moving away, this is going to be short by 23 yards. I think you guys get the idea. Wind is gonna be short by 10, and gun is gonna be over by 92. Now let's account for rotation of the Earth. If we look at our Earth rotation table for 10 degrees, we see that the mean of 63 and 89 is 76. So that's 76 over. So now we convert our initial velocity variations into yards of air. That's from powder temperature and erosion of the gun bore. There's a worksheet in the description of this video if you guys want to follow along at home. Now the range table states that a change in range of 10 feet per second at 10,000 yards will equal 72 yards. Powder temperature slows us down by four feet per second. So four divided by 10 times 72 is, we'll say 29. Makes sense. Now erosion of the gun bore slows us down by 60 feet per second. So 60 divided by 10 times 72 is Holy mother of dreadnought, 432 yards. Time to reline the guns. Now, we already worked out our air density. That'll shorten us by 100 yards. Now, since we're not firing off the line of sight, we need to account for trunnion height and curvature of the Earth. The trunnion heights on an Iowa-class battleship are all different. Turret 2's trunnions are about 34 feet 7 inches above the waterline. Turrets 1 and 3 are lower. The mean height is about 32 feet, so we'll just use that. You can think of it as raising the horizontal plane by 32 feet. So we need to figure out how much that's going to affect our range error. The range table states that a height increase of 30 feet will result in a range increase of 100 yards. So 32 times 100 divided by 30 is, we'll say, 107 yards. And that'll be over 107 yards. Now we have to account for the curvature of the Earth. The range table states that a target 10,000 yards away will drop by 21.5 feet. So we do the same with that, and we'll end up with, we'll say, 72 yards over. For a grand total, of range errors will be short by 247 yards. So now we have our errors, but what do we do about them? The only control we have over the trajectory is training and elevating the guns. The guns are laid based off of the line of sight, the range table data, and the ballistic correction. 
For our purposes, the line of sight is parallel to the horizontal plane because we can't see the target, but we know where it is. The range table states that our guns should be elevated to 302.9 minutes. Gun angle is always measured in minutes. Minutes are more precise than degrees because they represent 1 60th of a degree. Now since we found out the range table angle will cause us to land short by 247 yards, we need to increase it. The question is, by how much? The range table states to increase the range by 100 yards, we need to add 3.5 minutes to our gun angle. So for 247 yards, we divide that by 100 and multiply it by 3.5 to get 8.6 minutes. Now we add that to our range table calculations and we get 311.5 minutes. This 311.5 minutes is what is known as a sight angle. Sight angle comes from the days where you can only aim a gun based off the sights mounted alongside your gun. The sight moves with the gun. Since you always want your target in the sights, even when the gun is elevated for a long range shoot, you have to depress your sights by a certain angle. You then manually elevate your gun until the target is back on the sights. That's sight angle. So our line of fire starts at ship's bearing 320 degrees. Then we use the same technique to train the gun to the left and to the right of the line of sight. But instead of using minutes, we use something called mills. A mill is larger than a minute, but what's special about a mill is that if you extend an angle of one mil out to 10,000 yards, the lines will be exactly one yard apart. You can see how useful this will be when converting our ballistic correction to something the guns will use. The end result is called sight deflection. So let's convert our 13 yards left air to mils. We do that by dividing it by however many thousands are in the range. So 13 divided by 10 is 1.3. You can think of it as deflecting our sights to the left by 1.3 mils. So our guns will have to point to the right by 1.3 mils. Now obviously we can't see the target, so we compute our gun train order by taking 320 degrees and adding 1.3 mils. That's not really right though, is it? If you remember back to our metal ball launcher experiment, the turret was in the center of the ship. There's a reason I did that. The line of sight is based on a central location, but battleships don't have all their gun turrets in one place. So if our target is here, and our relative target bearing is 320 degrees, if we point our turret at 320 degrees, that's not going to work. What we need is a parallax correction. Mathematically, we can figure out what this angle is by using trigonometry. We know this side is the range. We know our base length. We know the angles. Somehow, we figure it out. But that's just for one turret. How do we make sure that all of our turrets are going to point to the target? We do this by having one relative bearing, the line of sight and then sending out a parallax range value to all the turrets, along with the computed gun orders. A mechanical computer in every turret automatically accounts for the horizontal parallax based on target range and its known distance from the reference point. I hope you noticed that we did not use calculus for any part of the fire control problem. Most sailors in World War II never took calculus, and to be honest, I've never met anyone who has used calculus for anything practical. Do you think they should stop requiring calculus in schools and higher education? Let us know in the comment section below, and don't forget to like and subscribe. In an upcoming episode, we'll talk about the devices battleships have to automatically track targets and aim the guns, as well as accounting for rough seas and entering an arbitrary correction to hit. In lieu of donations to me, please consider donating to a battleship museum like the Battleship Massachusetts. There's a link in the description that'll bring you to the USS Massachusetts Memorial Committee website where you can donate to the nonprofit organization. Don't forget to put Battleship Massachusetts in the notes of your donation so your money will go to the ship. Thanks for watching.